You know, a few years ago, you'd look east from Aberdeen towards the North Sea, and you'd basically see nothing but ships at anchor there to service the oil industry. But one year I returned home, I looked out towards the sea, and I saw this. Now these are part of the European Offshore Wind Deployment Centre. There's 11 Vestas V164 turbines and they're rated at either 8.4 or 8.8 .8 megawatts. The rotors are 164 metres in diameter with hub heights of about 120 metres. And you know from a distance they look pretty simple, but beneath the relatively simple facade lies a really complicated composite structure that's engineered to withstand decades offshore, under fatigue, ocean spray and turbulent wind conditions. In this video and in part two, we're going to look at the materials inside these blades and how they all come together. The first material we'll look at is glass fibre, and it's the primary reinforcement in most wind turbine blades. However, it's worth clearing up a common misconception. You know, when people say fibreglass or carbon fibre, they're often mistakenly referring to the finished composite part. But in reality, fibres are only part of the picture. They're embedded within a plastic resin. The resin binds and protects, whilst the fibres provide most of the strength and stiffness. So strictly speaking, fibreglass or carbon fibre should only describe the reinforcement itself. Now, glass fibre is made from common minerals, silica from quartz as the network former, alumina from bauxite for strength and durability, lime and magnesia from limestone and dolomite to control melting and fibre drawing, but also smaller amounts of other oxides that fine-tune processing and performance. Now there's two main categories of glass for engineering composites. The first is E-glass, where the E stands for electrical, and it's developed for insulation. It combines strength and chemical resistance and affordability, and it makes it the standard fibre in wind turbine blades and many other applications. The second is S-glass, where the S denotes stiff, structural, strength. It really depends on who you ask. It provides higher strength and stiffness but it's more expensive to produce, so it's usually used in aerospace and defense where performance outweighs cost. Once the glass is batched and melted, it's drawn into fibers through a precision machine bushing. The filaments are rapidly cooled, gathered and wound onto bobbins, where thousands are simultaneously produced. Now these bushings are made from very special platinum rhodium alloys, and they're specifically designed to withstand extreme heat and corrosion all whilst keeping fibre diameters very tightly controlled, typically between 10 and 20 microns or so. In terms of tensile strength, E-glass averages around 3.4 gigapascals, while S-glass reaches nearly 5 gigapascals. S-glass also has a higher elastic modulus, in other words, a greater stiffness under load. Both types, however, share similar densities of about 2.5 grams per cubic centimetre, and this means that S-glass achieves superior specific properties, though at higher cost. Now, once drawn, these continuous bundles of fibres, referred to as robings or toads, are converted into fabrics. And one of the simplest forms is a plane weave, where rovings are crossed over and under at right angles. It's a stable and easy to handle fabric, but the crimp produces efficiency. A two by two twill weave gives a more flexible fabric. It's easier to drape over complex shapes, and it also allows loads to still be carried in two directions. For large composites like turbine blades, non-crimp fabrics are common. Layers of straight rovings are laid down flat and they're stitched together, avoiding the crimp of woven fabrics. Multi-axial NCF combines several stitched layers at different orientations, giving strength across multiple directions while keeping fibre straight for higher efficiency. Unidirectional stitched fabrics put almost all fibres in one direction. These are used around the blade spars where the load runs lengthwise along the structure. Lastly, random strand mat is made from short fibers held together with a binder in a random orientation. It's inexpensive and relatively isotropic, but weaker. So it's used fairly sparingly in non-structurally demanding applications. Now, while glass dominates blade construction, Carbon fibres are also used in certain designs, particularly in very large turbines where extra stiffness is needed. Carbon fibre is widely recognised for high performance products, think bicycles or aerospace components. And like glass, it can be woven or stitched into fabrics. 
tailored to carry these very high loads very efficiently. In blades, protruded laminates, i.e. long, uniform, carbon fibre reinforced plastic planks, are often embedded within the glass fibre layup, and this is used to increase stiffness along the blade length. When we compare specific strength, carbon fibre is almost double that of e-glass. In terms of specific modulus, the gap is actually even larger. Carbon is around four times stiffer per unit weight, which is why it's so effective in reducing blade deflection. The trade-off is cost. Carbon fibre is far more expensive, so in blades it's only used selectively, typically where stiffness is most crucial. So that's it for fibres. From e-glass and s-glass to fabrics and carbon, they provide the strength and stiffness that allow blades to carry such immense loads. In part two, we'll turn to the other critical ingredients, resins, cores and inserts, and we'll see how they're all combined during manufacture to survive these extreme conditions. Thanks very much for watching. If you found this video useful, give it a like and comment down below and subscribe to the channel for the upcoming videos.